glory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for being so awesome, so wonderful, so holy. You are are everything, Lord, and I just thank you that forgiveness is found in you. You are so merciful, so full of compassion, so full of grace, and I thank you, Lord, for being so patient with us, Lord God, as a father pities their children, so you pity those who fear you, and uh, I thank you for the salvation that you've wrought on the cross by sending us King Jesus, your son, to die on the cross and pay the price that only he could pay on our behalf for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord. And we confess our sins to you, everything that was not pleasing in your sight. We plead the blood of Jesus to cleanse us and wash us from all filthiness of the flesh and sanctify us and set us apart for your glory, for your use. May we be a vessel set apart for your righteous works to act in us and through us so that we can bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit, which dwells in us, which allows us to walk in holiness, which allows us to be the light because it's your light that shines in us through the new birth. And we just give you all the praise. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and here we are, Lord, we're asking that you would teach us great and mighty things that we do not know. Our mouths are open wide. Please fill it. Please open up your words that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. Help us, Holy Spirit, and guide us and lead us into all truth. We pray for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. May we all be edified and come to a right knowledge and understanding of what thus saith the Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask it all. Amen. Well, thank you for coming back to another teaching installment of When the Temple in Heaven is Open, Everything Will Change. And today I have three points. I got three points that I want to talk about. A three-point sermon. And uh, not a three-point sermon, I guess a three-point teaching. Um, but the first point is actually I want to... Um, boast in the Lord a little bit. And the second point, uh, the second and third point, I want to answer a couple questions from my last video. Uh, I want to be a man of my word. And I said that if you had any questions in the comment box, um, please give them. I'm going to answer them. And so these two questions stuck out because they come out, a, they come up a lot. And uh, the second um, point will be why is Babylon known as uh, that great city? Why is it called a great city? How can Babylon be um, the United States of America when we know America as a nation in our language? Um, so why does God call Babylon a great city? So we're going to get to that. And the third point is, um, there was another question regarding why isn't Alexander the Great considered one of those um mountains um and his four generals how come they're not altogether considered um five mountains um but i'm gonna clear up that confusion because we're going to talk about um the the seven kings um and then the eighth king and so once we get to the third point that that question will come up and and by the power of the holy spirit it will be answered and we'll come to a right understanding of what thus saith the Lord. So to start off, you know, today was, um, oh, it was such a wonderful sermon from Pastor Sandy, his his latest teaching today uh, for his Sunday service. Oh, it was just so powerful. It was so powerful. And, uh, you know, I was um, at the gym and I listened to it. You know, I like to listen to uh, teachings while I do, you know, workouts and work on the treadmill. And, and so I was on, um, uh, you know, the Stairmaster at, at the gym today and I was listening to Pastor Sandy's sermon and it was just so awesome because it spoke right to me. It spoke right to me about sanctification and, you know, finishing the work that God has given us to do. And, you know, it was just, um, an encouraging word because, you know, 
uh, this is why I want to boast. Let me just read this. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. This is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom or the powerful boast in their power or the rich boast in their riches. <laughs> but those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. <laughs> Hallelujah. You see, uh, to be transparent, you see, um, and this is, this is, this is, um, to be transparent with you, you know, every time I go on the mission field as far as like a foreign journey uh, to spread the good news, every time I come back, you know, the spiritual attacks are that much greater. I mean, of course, you know, he's coming day after day talking about the enemy. You know, some way, somehow he's going to slither in and try to tempt us some way, somehow. But, you know, um, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world all day, every day. Hallelujah. But sometimes those flames get hot and <laughs> uh, um, it, it, it never fails. Every time I come back from an overseas mission trip, the enemy, he, he, he hates what's been done, of course. And so uh, once I get back home, he, here he comes, you know, with a vengeance, you know, it, it's always uh, he always turns up the heat somehow, some way, you know, you know how he works. You know, he, he tempts us. In, 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 in ways that he knows how to tempt us uh, with and with things he knows uh, uh, that are temptable to us. And um, none of us are exempt. I mean, he came after the Savior. Hallelujah. He came after God in the flesh. Okay, so none of us are exempt from his attacks. But, you know, uh, from this trip, you know, it was just a little bit, it was just a little bit hotter with these temptations and, you know, um, praise God that he's given me the victory. Hallelujah. Uh, we overcome him by um, the blood of the lamb and by the words uh, of our testimony. Hallelujah. And so I'm going to testify, okay, because uh, the other day, the, well, not the other, I mean, you know, just last night, okay, this guy, talking about the enemy, he came with a temptation that I haven't had in years. I'm talking about in years. This hasn't been tempting to me like it was last night in years, okay? And 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 I had, you know, I was on the edge, you know, to be transparent. You know, I was even um you know, weighing out the possibilities of doing it, okay? And that that's how that's how that's how tempting this temptation was. And this was a temptation that God has given me the victory over uh, long ago, hallelujah, praise his holy name, he's delivered me, and uh, the victory was won again last night, but the point is that this temptation came out of left field, I haven't been tempted uh, to do this um, uh, sin in forever, you know, I mean, you know, well, not forever, but it's for a long time, but then here he came with this temptation, and he's been setting it up, he had been setting it up, and it, 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 it sounded good when he when he slithered into my mind, and he put the thought in there because it begins with the thought, and then I began to think about it, and then I began to weigh my options and the possibilities. But praise be to God, hallelujah, that he was defeated again because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And when I heard Pastor Sandy's uh, teaching today, you know, it was just another confirmation, you know, about the goodness of the Lord and uh, sanctification. Hallelujah. You see, God has been sanctifying all of us and uh, he continues to set us apart, you know, and and, and when I was in, um, when I was at, at the gym earlier today and I was listening to the sermon and when he got to about 33 minutes in to his sermon and he was talking about sanctification and uh, finishing the work that he gave us to do, talking about King Jesus, finishing what the job that he's given us to do. You know, God spoke to me in that sauna, because then I was in the sauna at that time. And he said, he said exactly this. This is what he told me. He said, don't look back. 
he said, finish the work God gave me to do. And he gave me the three things that he's always told me to finish, you know, uh, proclaim the day of the Lord, one, expound upon the prophetic scriptures, two, and preach the good news, three. I mean, of course, you know, the order is, 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 is interchangeable, you know, but I'm, that, but the point is that is what the work that God has given me to do. And he made it so clear when I was sitting in the sauna, listening to what pastor Sandy was saying in his last sermon. And it was just another confidence booster, another confirmation that, you know, how God works. He just gives us, um, these energy boosts through the power of the Holy Spirit when he speaks truth to us, whether it be through his word or through his servants or however else he wants to use his creation to demonstrate his power, to show himself strong on behalf of those who believe. And wow, it was just uh, because uh, of that temptation that was defeated again yesterday. I mean, a temptation that came out of left field that I haven't been tempted with in years and, and the enemy. Oh my, oh my goodness. He's a subtle one. Okay. And you see, you see, he don't like it when you talk about him, you see, because I'm going to talk about him. Okay. I'm going to talk about the enemy. Okay. I, I, I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell the truth and I'm going to shame the devil. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to air him out. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak the truth and I'm going to declare, uh, what well, thus saith the Lord in regards to him, okay? And he don't like it. He don't like it one, well, whatsoever. And, you know, whenever you, you you stand on the side of righteousness, he's going to come at you. You know it just as well as I know it. And sometimes he, 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 he comes in ways that you least expect, okay? As my pastor uh, likes to put it, uh, when you least expect it, you're elected, okay? Uh, when you least expect it, here he comes. And oh my goodness, I didn't expect that temptation last night. But I'm going to boast in Jesus because he gave me the victory. Hallelujah. He gave me the victory. Hallelujah. And um, I forgot uh, at the end, um, when God was talking to me in the sauna while I was listening to the pastor, Sandy, Sandy, after he told me, to finish the work that he's given me to do, those three things. He said, then you will find rest for your soul. <laughs> uh, hallelujah. It was just it was just clear as day in my spirit, you know. Uh, then he said, you will find rest for your soul. You see, there's rest in Jesus. Hallelujah. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and he will give us rest. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hallelujah. You see, that's why we can do what God says we can do here in Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 24. When we boast, we boast that we know him, that we know and that we understand that he is the Lord. And what does he do? He demonstrates his unfailing love. Okay. He's a, he, he, he's, oh, he's so long suffering. Okay. There's so much wrapped up in his love. It's just, it's unfathomable, the love of God, because God is love. Oh my goodness. And it was just um, so refreshing to hear that word of encouragement uh, from Pastor Sandy, because we're all in the process of sanctification. Hallelujah. God is a, it's a continual process of saying yes to Jesus and no to sin. And uh, yesterday, you know, um, in my mind, OK, in my mind, because it starts with a thought, I, I was on the tipping point. And Lord knows if I, I, and I don't even want to go down that road because I didn't go down that road. But, uh, you know, the Bible says that there's a sin unto death. And, you know, I was just thinking today, if I would have went down that road, you know, I might not have been making this video right now. God might have uh, taken me out because as Pastor Sandy said, God, well, like the Bible says, you know, uh, God is not mocked. Okay. He, 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 he'll take you out. Okay. If you keep on you know, pushing the envelope and then you go back to your vomit. If you look back if and I put my hand to the plow, then I go back to something that I haven't done in years that God has delivered me from, that I struggled with in my early times in my walk, but God has set me free long ago. And then I go back to that. Oh my goodness. And I was just thanking the Lord all day today in my mind. I was thankful. Like, 
Thank you, Lord, for keeping me from that vomit. Oh, because because you know that 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 is just nothing but filth back there. I can't even go back to that. But you know, um, it's good to boast about how God is working on our behalf. You know, to um, to give a praise report and. Uh, and if you haven't seen Pastor Sandy's uh, video for Sunday, uh, what's today? The 4th? The 4th of November. If you haven't seen his video, I, I recommend you see it because it's a wonderful teaching. And uh, I pray that you're edified. But yes, I just wanted to boast in the Lord a little bit. And so let, let's get to the teaching about Babylon the Great. Hallelujah. Okay, so uh, a couple of questions on my page about Babylon the Great. And the first question was... Why is Babylon the Great called a great city? Okay, and so if Babylon the Great is a great city, how can it be America? Pretty much that's the question. So let's go to the verse. Revelation chapter 17 verse 18 says this, And the woman which you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Okay, so God says that Babylon the Great, which is the woman, is called a great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So let's just look at the Greek just to highlight some things. Okay, let's look at this Greek. And God says that Babylon the Great is, uh, let me go to verse 18, I'm sorry. Verse 18, praise the Lord. Babylon the Great is called a uh, megale polis. So it's, 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 it's not just a polis. A polis is a city, but it's a megala. A megala is, it, it means great. It means large, great in the widest sense. Okay. So this is something mega. Okay. Megas. Okay. You know, the, the English word mega, mega. Okay. So this is a mega city. Okay. It's just not any old city. Okay. It, it's a mega city. Okay. Babylon the Great is a mega city. It's a mega polis. Polis is city. Let's look at the Greek for city. Polis, a city. Okay. So it's a mega city. So it's not just um, a city, but it's um, a city in the widest sense of the word. Okay. Let's go back to the Greek of mega. Uh, yeah, let's just look at the Greek again. Mega, it means large, great, in the widest sense. Okay, so it's as big as you can imagine. That's what mega means. Okay, and so Babylon the Great is not just a city as we think of as a city, like a city, say, um, New York. Okay, that's a city. Okay, um, but Babylon the Great is something bigger than the city. Babylon the Great is a mega city. That's why God says it's that great city. And, and just in comparison, I want to make a comparison so you can get what God is saying. In regards to the New Jerusalem, where we will live forever, God calls that a city, okay? The city that he's made with his own hands, okay? He calls it a city. He doesn't, there's never the word mega attached to city in regards to the new Jerusalem. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 16, talking about uh, the new Jerusalem, he, he says that he, he gives the dimensions for the city, okay? And the city, when it was measured, he found it was square as wide as it was long. In fact, it, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles, okay? So God, when describing... Um, the city of the righteous, where we will dwell for all eternity. This city is like no other city on the earth. I mean, this is, this is a city made by the hands of God. This was the city that Abraham said that he was looking for. Okay, and, that, and this is the city that we are looking for, where we're going to dwell with God himself forever and ever and ever for all eternity. But the point is that God never put the um, prefix mega before this city. And look how big this city is, okay? The New Jerusalem where we will spend eternity uh, It's 1,400 miles long, 1,400 miles in height, and uh, 1,400 miles in width, okay? There, there's no city like it on the planet. And just for perspective, look at this. 
uh, I put the size of the New Jerusalem in a Google search and just look at in comparison how big this city is when placed upon the globe. Okay, and, and <laughs> please, <laughs> oh my goodness, I can just see the comments now. Okay, I don't want to get into the flat earth. Okay, I know some people just cringe when they see this 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 round earth. I mean, please, I just don't want to get into that discussion at all because it's just it's just really not profitable for me. I want to I want to stick to what the Bible is talking about in regards to the end days. I mean, you know, I didn't want to go down that road. Just please, okay, just please. I just want to just show you these comparison pictures okay if you don't believe that the earth is is a round sphere okay 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 we 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 we, we let, let's just agree on the essentials and the essentials is do you believe that jesus christ is god in the flesh the savior of our soul that he's coming again to get us that he's going to put down sin and rebellion and make all things new let's agree on the essentials oh my goodness please Okay, because I'm not the one to debate this flat earth thing. I'm just not the one. Okay. And there's a lot bigger fish to fry, in my opinion. Okay. Because I I, I want to talk about um what's coming, okay? Because I'm 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 looking for the king to come. Hallelujah. I, I want to go to the father's house, okay? Hallelujah. But okay, so here here we see in comparison how big the new Jerusalem is when put upon the globe and look how big it is compared it almost takes up the whole entire united states look at this picture where my yellow marker is look at this this is how big it is just uh you know um all around okay it's not even talking about the width and the height and 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 it almost takes up most of america and the point is that new jerusalem is called a city it's not called a megapolis which babylon the great is Okay, Babylon the Great is called a megapolis. Look how big it is, um, the New Jerusalem, compared to the continent of Australia. It's almost as big as Australia. Okay, so that's the point. You see, the New Jerusalem is 1,400 miles wide, 1,400 miles um, in height, and 1,400 miles in width. Okay, and um, God calls it a city. Okay, you could go through Revelation chapter 21, and it, it, it will always say city, the city, the city. Okay, it never says um, great city. Great city is only uh, referenced in regards to uh, Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great is called that great city. So Babylon the Great um, is a city in the widest sense of um the term city and this is further hammered home okay let me just show you this I, I did a, i did another little search and talking about um how big the new jerusalem is and it's just called the city where we're going to live at forever and um talking about how many people could fit in this city okay uh, i just highlight this one um paragraph one estimate of the total number of humans that have ever lived on this planet puts the figure at around 106.5 billion for the sake of argument if we assume each and every one gets a place in the city that leaves enough room for everyone to have a house that's 1500 feet on each side or 2.25 million square feet on each level and around 150 stories tall in other words, it seems there will be more than enough room for everyone. Okay, so you get the picture. If if 106.5 billion people were put into the New Jerusalem, the the uh, uh, the whole uh, city um, would still have enough room for everybody. Okay, and the point is that God calls New Jerusalem a city, but He puts the prefix mega. Polis in regards to Babylon the Great. Revelation 17 verse 18, and the woman which you saw is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So it's a megapolis, okay? So it's 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 the widest sense that you can ever think of in regards to a city. Now to hammer home the point, Jeremiah chapter 50 tells us about Babylon, okay? Now look at this. Jeremiah chapter verse uh, chapter 50 verse 31 and 32 talking about the destruction of Babylon okay the far fulfillment of it 
Verse 31, Behold, I am against you, O thou most proud, saith the Lord God of hosts, for your day has come, the time that I will visit you, and the most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise him up, and I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it shall devour all around about him. Okay, so here we see that God is against the most proud. The most proud is Babylon. And God says that one day, Babylon's day will come. And when that day comes, it's going to be the time when he, when he personally visits Babylon. Okay. Uh, we know that this wasn't done in the days of Daniel when Babylon was taken over by the Medes and Persians. Okay. God didn't personally visit um, Babylon with fire. Okay, we know from um, history, we know from um, recorded history how Babylon was taken by the Medes and Persians. Even in the Bible, it tells us how it was taken. It was taken over. It wasn't totally destroyed. God didn't come to visit uh, Babylon with fire. Okay, not the, not the Babylon of Daniel's day. So God is talking about a future fulfillment of this prophecy. And the future fulfillment of this prophecy is in regards to Babylon the Great. And Babylon the Great is going to be destroyed with fire. Okay, it's going to be burnt with fire. And God said that when the fire comes, it's going to come in his cities, plural. Okay, the Hebrew word, let me show you the Hebrew word so there can be no confusion. Babylon is said to have multiple cities, okay? Babylon is said to have multiple cities, okay? Um, so Babylon is made up of multiple cities that God said he's going to visit and destroy with fire. Okay. The cities of Babylon. Okay. In his cities, it's plural. Okay. So there are cities that make up Babylon. Um, the Hebrew word, uh, is IR. Okay. And, um, it means, uh, a city, um, uh, praise the Lord, a city, uh, town, in the plural is I-R, A-R, okay? So it's in the plural, okay? So uh, it's a multiplication of cities. It's, it's a multitude of cities that God is going to set fire to that all um, are in Babylon, okay? Be'ara, be okay? That's, uh, that's uh, the plural in the Hebrew. So it's cities, okay? Plural, cities, Okay, so when Babylon is visited by God himself and the fire comes, it's going to consume the cities of Babylon. I will light a fire in the cities of Babylon. I will kindle a fire in his cities. Okay, so it's plural. Cities, cities, okay, in his cities. Okay, so in his cities, okay, so it's uh, uh, Babylon the Great, the megapolis, okay, the, the city in the widest sense of the term, according to the New Testament revelation in Revelation chapter 17. In the Old Testament shadow, God says he's going to start a fire in the cities of Babylon. And we know from even in ancient Babylon, Babylon was an empire, okay? Yes, it had a capital, okay? Just like all uh, empires have a capital. But the, uh, but the empire stretched over um, a vast uh, amount of territory. I mean, just all you had to do was just type in uh, the Babylonian Empire, ancient Babylon map. You could just pull up all these pictures to see the extent of the Babylonian Empire, how far it stretched, okay? Yes, Babylon was uh, talking about where, you know, the hanging gardens were, where the, where the capital was. That, that was the capital of Babylon, but Babylon... Uh, consisted of a wide area, okay? And it was all considered Babylon. It was the empire of Babylon. Likewise, Revelation chapter 17 tells us that Babylon the Great is a great city, a city in the widest sense of the word. You, you We saw the Greek, it's a megapolis, okay? And God doesn't even attach megapolis to the New Jerusalem. And we, and we already saw how big the new Jerusalem is going to be, okay? Uh, but yet, God says that Babylon the Great, which is um, still bigger in length than the new Jerusalem, um, is a great city, 
Okay, it's a megapolis. And that's the point. This megapolis encompasses far more than just one city. There's a multitude of cities that that make up Babylon the Great, as we read in Jeremiah chapter 50. Okay, so when we take the whole counsel of God, when we put all the pieces together, we can see that God is talking about something far bigger than what our minds are used to envisioning. And again, we have to put this in the context of the day of the Lord. Okay, the day of the Lord is, is when this all happens, my friends, we're going to be out of here. If you know Jesus, we're going to be taken up. We're going to be out of here. But if you're left behind, this day that's going to come is just, it, it's really incomprehensible. No one has ever seen the type of destruction that's going to come on this day. And we're just talking about the beginning. We're talking about the day of sudden destruction. We're talking about when it all begins. On the day when, when everything goes up in smokes, when, when this whole world that we see today is falling, okay? When everything is, is just, <laughs> everything is just knocked down to the ground. Everything is leveled, okay? Just like the Bible says, all the walls are going to fall, okay? The mountains are going to be uh, uh, shaken, okay? The, uh, the islands aren't, aren't going to be found. Everything is going to be moved out of its place. We're talking about something so cataclysmic, it boggles the mind. And this is just at the beginning, okay? And once it all is, once the dust settles and, um, uh, you know, uh, the proverbial phoenix rises, okay? The phoenix rising being the new world order and, and in biblical terms, the fourth beast kingdom. Um, once that, once the dust settles and, it, and the tribulation begins when the antichrist appears and he confirms the covenant with many for seven years, <laughs> Uh, when that day comes, one-fourth of the world's population will be dead. One-fourth, okay? One-fourth of the world's population will be dead, okay? That's over a billion people, okay? And that's on the low end of the spectrum. I mean, there's what? There's 7.6, 7 7.7, 7 7.8 billion people on the planet now. I mean, let's just be generous and say... um. One billion people were raptured, alive, okay? We know that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. That, that, I mean, that's countless. Who knows how many, how many is in that number? But we will know when we see them. But for those who are alive and remain when it happens, from this world's population, let's just, let's just be generous. I don't know how many is going to be taken. But let's just say a billion, okay? Let's just say a billion just to, you know, have a round number. That still leaves over... Uh, six billion people um, on the planet left behind, okay? And if one-fourth of those six billion people die, okay, one-fourth, what is that? That's um, 1.5 billion people, okay? But I, again, you know, there's still, that's still, it's 1.5 billion plus, okay, billion people dead from the beginning of the terrible day of the Lord, okay? I mean, we're talking about, catastrophic destruction okay i mean and what there's 350 million people in the united states of america i mean that's nothing compared to the destruction that's going to come upon the whole world so we got to think in things of of, of 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 apocalyptic destruction that's coming okay it's not a pretty sight okay it's not pretty but the bible goes ad nauseum with it in describing it. I mean, because it's all, it's all in the prophets. Oh my goodness. All you got to do is open up the prophets. I mean, the more I read the Bible, the more it just reads about the end times. It's like the whole Bible is about what's coming. I mean, I've just, I just never seen it like I've seen it now, but God has opened up his word in this last hour to understand it. It's, it's like, it's like a, I mean, everything that he's about to do, you know, it, it's a shadow it's just so much. I mean, you just read the prophetic scriptures. All the prophets talk about this day. Okay, it's just, it's just, all the prophets talk about this day. It's just like, wow. I've never seen it like this, um, uh, like, I, like I'm seeing it now, because he's talking about the destruction that's going to come when it all begins, okay? Um, and, 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 it's, and it's really, it's really, you know, it's really mind boggling, you know, it's really mind boggling, you know, and, and, you know, we really can't fathom it, you know, um, but hey, uh, God said, well, let me here, let me just give you an example. Okay. 
let's just go down this little bunny trail right quick <laughs> and then i'm gonna get to the second point i don't want to go over an hour on this teaching i just want to keep this short but let, let, look at micah okay look at micah 1 1 okay now the, look 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 at what god is saying just just in um the first couple uh 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 let me just go to let's read this uh, the first couple verses micah chapter 1 uh verses 1 through 4 the word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morshite in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear, all you people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. <laughs> Look at this, verse 3. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountain shall be molten unto him, and the valley shall be cleft as wax before the fire, and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. Okay, I mean, look at this imagery. This is a picture of what is going to take place at the time of the rapture, when the Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God. Okay, this is what's going to happen. The Lord is going to come out of his place. He's going to come out of the temple. He's going to come down. He's going to call those who are ready up to meet him. But if you're left behind, look what he's going to do. He's going to tread upon the high places of the earth. Okay, everything is going to be molten under him. Verse 4, the mountains shall be molten under him. Okay, the mountains are going to shake. The mountains are going to be moved, okay? Mount Everest is going to shake. It's going to be toppled. Every wall is going to fall to the ground, according to Ezekiel chapter 38, with the battle of Gog and Magog. Because that's when he comes, okay? That's when he comes down. That's when he fights on behalf of Israel. And he rains down hailstones and coals of fire, and he sends the greatest earthquake in human history. That's what the Bible says. Oh, my goodness. But we see just a picture of what's going to happen on this day. So the point is, okay, we have to think big. We have to think big in the terms of the destruction that's, that's coming on this planet. So when it says that Babylon the Great is going to be destroyed, okay, it, it's talking about that mega city that reigns over the kings of the earth. And that mega city is the United States of America. It's this United States of America. It's, it's the city, that mega city that reigns over all the kings of the earth, okay? Um, that mega city that reigns over all the kings of the earth, okay? It's, it's this whole area, okay? There's only, what, 350 million people who live here plus? But then, you know, there's a lot of Christians in here. That's why he says to his people who are in here, he's going to save us out of here. Okay, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of believers because remember Babylon the Great has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Babylon the Great was a light unto the nations in the end times. Okay, it was the last of the nations. But um, a long time ago, America uh, went um, down a wrong path and America turned its back on God and Instead of being that golden cup in the Lord's hands, uh, which was uh, uh, being a light to the world, America filled that golden cup with wickedness and filthiness of her fornication and has made all the nations of the world drink of it. Okay, but I mean, <laughs> you see, even the Bible talks about how Babylon the Great engaged in witchcraft from her youth. Okay, because God knows everything. OK, even even the foundation of America was wicked because remember, the world is filled with sinful people. We were born in sin. OK, and God knows the ancient practices. OK, of Babylon the Great. OK, it was it was founded upon wickedness and God calls it out. If you read Isaiah chapter 47, OK, he calls out um, uh, the ancient practices, OK, that uh, Babylon engaged in from her youth, okay, in secret. But God, you know, because he's merciful, he let uh, everything play out because God had a purpose. And uh, the purpose was that Babylon, America, was to be that light to bring um, the gospel uh, to the four corners of the world uh, leading up to the end of the age. But because now Babylon has turned its back on God, instead of being 
a, a nation that sent out missionaries across the world. Now this nation d has sent out um, everything that God is against to the whole world with American culture, okay, with American culture that's dominated by entertainment, which is godless, okay, the music industry, the, the movie industry, um, you know, uh, it's liberalism, you know, with homosexual marriage, with, uh, uh, we, with pornography, you know, everything that God is against, you know, with alcoholism, I mean, everything that's promoted, okay, it all, and, and you know, a lot of the modern day inventions were invented in America, okay, the plane, okay, uh, 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 what, the uh, electricity and uh, the TV, you know, all, all of these modern inventions during the Industrial Revolution, the automobile, you know, it was all made here. Okay, it was all made in America, all the modern conveniences that the world enjoys. But, you know, uh, now uh, America has taken all of it and, and, and twisted it, okay, and, 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 and uses all of it to corrupt the whole world with um, her influence and her power because America, that great city, that megapolis, reigns over all the kings of the earth, okay? It, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to... Uh, look at reality and to see how America influences the world. There's no other nation on the planet that influences the world like America. I mean, you just can't, you just, I mean, you really can't argue it. Okay. You, you could, you could go to the conspiracy theories and you could, you could talk about the power behind it, you know, with the Vatican and the Jesuits and all that. I mean, you could, you could go there. Okay. But, you know, I just want to deal with, you know, what, what the reality, okay. And I'm not discounting, the harlotry of the of the Catholic Church, but you know, it's just we just have to see everything for what it is, and we have to understand that the time is short. Okay, uh, but let me get back to this teaching before I start ranting about Babylon the Great. Um, let me get to the third point. So I, I pray that the megapolis was clear; it was cleared up. The megapolis. Okay, so Babylon, that great city, is a mega city. It's a city in the widest sense. Okay, and even when God describes the New Jerusalem, He calls it just a city. Okay, but Babylon the Great is that great city, a megapolis. Okay, so it's 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 it's, it's it, and it has many cities, according to Jeremiah chapter fifty. It could be none other than America, because America is the only superpower in the world today that has global influence you know no matter where you go okay no matter where you go i've been to all well, i haven't i've been to i've been to all six continents but there's seven i haven't been to antarctica but i've been to six continents you know in every place i've been to no matter where you go the english language is spoken there and understood even the signs on the freeway it will be written in the local language, and then you will see English. Even in China, okay? Even in China, you will see the Chinese characters, and then you will see the English. You go to Jerusalem, you, see, uh, you will see Hebrew, um, Arabic, and then you will see English. Okay, you go down to Latin American countries, you will see Spanish and then English. Okay, Africa, okay, English, okay, in, in certain countries that I've been to. Europe, of course, okay, Australia. Uh, English, uh, you, no matter where you go, okay, you will see English. And uh, that goes back to, you know, um, how America has a mother country. Okay, let me just show you this. And then I'm going to go to the second, uh, the third point. Okay, because we know where English came from. It came from the mother country of Babylon the Great. Okay, this is another layer of, of understanding and interpretation. Uh, praise the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 50 um, Verse 12, um, your mother shall be sore confounded. She that bear you shall be ashamed. Behold, the hindermost, which means the last of the nations, shall be a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. So Babylon is said to have a mother nation. And um, Babylon um, is going to be the last of the nations. Hindermost means the last. Okay, so... And if this is the end, which it is, the last of the nations, meaning the last superpower, the one who rides over the beast right now, Babylon the Great, who has control over the whole world, uh, that last nation is none other than America, which had a mother. And that mother nation was England. 
And you know that old saying that the sun never sets on the on the British Empire, okay? Because that mother nation, England, uh, was the one who colonized a lot of the world in order for the world to speak English, okay? But then America just picked up the mantle and 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 has done it um, um, in these last days, okay? So. The American influence has spread all over the world to the four corners of the world, and that's and and it's the continuation of that leopard kingdom. Okay, it's the final form of the leopard kingdom, and that's what I want to get to right now. That's what I want to get to with this third point. Okay, so the third question. Yes, I wanted to um, get the question exactly right. This was from Lewis Fletcher, and he said. James, in your opinion, why isn't Alexander the Great one of the heads? It seems like he and his four generals would have been five heads. Just asking. So the reason why Alexander the Great isn't one of the heads in regards to um, the seven heads, which are seven mountains, is because um, the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 7 that the leopard has four heads. Okay, the leopard has four heads, not five heads. Um, but Alexander the Great, well, let me just show you here. Let me show you Daniel, I'm, I'm, because um, <laughs> uh, I don't want to. I don't want to mess this up. Uh, help us, Holy Spirit. Alexander the Great is mentioned. Okay, Alexander the Great is mentioned, but he's mentioned in regards to the seven kings. Okay, now let me just show you why he's not part of the seven heads. Daniel chapter seven. Here goes, um, here goes the, the four beast. Um, let's focus on this third beast, which is the leopard. Daniel chapter 7, verse 6. After this, I beheld and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of its four wings of a fowl, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So this leopard kingdom has four heads. Okay. So this leopard kingdom represented by the four heads represents when his when the leopard kingdom which is greece was broken up into four different parts and spread to the four corners of the world which is why it has four wings of a fowl on his back okay the first king which is alexander the great isn't mentioned here but alexander the great is mentioned in regard to the seven kings okay so we still need to have wisdom because uh, it's still a continuation of verse 9. And here is the mind which has wisdom. Uh, it's still a continuation. So verse 10 says this. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. And one is. And the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. Okay. So I've done teachings on this plenty of times. Because the seventh king is here. And before I get to the seventh king, let me talk about the five kings who have fallen. So John is saying that. We have to have wisdom still, so we need to go to the Word of God because God gives wisdom and God speaks to us through His Word. So we're going to find the answer in His Word. And so by the time that John wrote this, John said that five of the seven kings had already fallen. Daniel chapter 8 tells us who those five kings are. And we get the answer in Daniel chapter 8. Okay, and here we go. Verse 21. And the rough goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Okay, so here we get the first king, and the first king is the king of Greece. Okay, so let me just back up just in case you don't know the context of what Daniel 8 is talking about. Daniel 8 is about the vision he received in regards to the ram and the goat. The goat is um, Greece, and the ram is Media Persia. So Daniel is seeing how the power will be transformed, I mean, not transformed, transferred from the Media Persian Empire to the Grecian Empire. But he sees it in a vision in, in a relation to a ram and a goat. But to juxtapose, to, but to juxtapose this, this vision upon Daniel 7, the ram would be the bear, okay? The ram here, which is Media Persia, will be the bear in 
Daniel chapter 7. And the goat here in Daniel chapter 8 will be the leopard in Daniel chapter 7. I pray that that's clear. Okay, I mean, even the commentaries, if you have a good Bible-believing commentary, you'll see the same thing. So God is just using these two different animals, the ram and the goat, to talk about the same things he already discussed in Daniel chapter 7. Okay, the ram is Media Persia, which in Daniel chapter 7 is known as the bear. And the goat is Greece, which in Daniel chapter 7 is the leopard with four heads and four wings of a fowl. So here Daniel is seeing a future vision of how that Media Persian Empire is going to be destroyed because this is a prophecy in Daniel's day. Remember, Daniel was um, still under um, the rule of Belshazzar. He was, Babylon still hadn't been overtaken yet. Okay, Belshazzar was the king over Babylon. And so um, uh, the ram, which is the bear, which is Media Persia, still hadn't came and defeated Babylon yet. So at the time of this vision that Daniel got, this was a future vision, okay? And so God is speaking to Daniel about Alexander the Great, okay, who would later come. You know, this is hundreds of years later, okay? That's why when um, it's said in history that when Daniel, I mean, not when Daniel, when Alexander the Great came to Israel, okay, um, he didn't destroy it because uh, they showed him they showed Alexander the Great this prophecy. They showed him Daniel chapter 8 when Alex Alexander the Great came to Israel because Israel was, again, they were back in the land of Israel. Okay, they had been led, led in out of Babylon the Great once the, I mean, they had been led in out of Babylon once the 70 years were accomplished and they went back to Israel. And so by the time Alexander the Great came around, um, Israel was already in the land again. Okay. And once Alexander the Great came down to Israel, it said that they showed him this scroll of Daniel chapter 8, where um, it prophesied about this king of Greece, which was going to be the first king, which is, of course, um, Alexander the Great. So I pray that you got the background. So let me, let me, let me um, continue with the teaching of Revelation chapter 17. And there are seven kings, five are fallen. And let's go to the five who are who have fallen. So by the time John, who was writing Revelation, was writing this, he said five of the seven kings had already fallen. Daniel chapter 8 tells us who those five fallen kings are. Um, verse 21, and the rough goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Okay, so that's Alexander the Great, verse 22. Now that being broken... Whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. Okay, so here we go with um, uh, the five all together. Okay, the four who stood up were the four generals who took over the Grecian Empire when um, the first king died. The first king, Alexander the Great, he died in Babylon. Once he died... Uh, uh, his four generals took over because he had no heir. Okay, he had no um, son. So his four generals took over and the kingdom was divided up. Okay, that's why the leopard in Daniel chapter 7 has four heads. Okay, um, but because uh, this Grecian empire um, spread to the four corners of the world, that's why the, um, the leopard has four wings of a fowl. Um, this... Grecian influence has spread even up until this day because it's still in power, okay? That's why when we read Daniel chapter 7, um, the next kingdom who comes after the leopard, the next kingdom who comes after the leopard is the fourth beast kingdom, okay? So after the leopard is the fourth beast kingdom. That fourth beast kingdom is the kingdom of the Antichrist because it has the ten horns, Okay, the kingdom of the Antichrist is that fourth beast kingdom, which is dreadful and terrible, and it's different from every kingdom that came before it. So at the time of the end, the leopard kingdom is still in control, and the leopard kingdom um, 
which is the foundation of all Western ideals, is wrapped up in Babylon the Great. And we see the same story being played out here in Daniel chapter 8. So let's continue with, with this prophecy. Okay, so Daniel, is he's again, he's prophesying. And he's saying in verse 23, and in the latter time of their kingdom, he's still prophesying about that Grecian, that Grecian empire um, that was broken up into four kingdoms. The leopard kingdom with four heads, four uh, wings of a fowl. In the latter time of that kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. So it's not until um, the transgressors have come to the full at the latter time of the Grecian Empire that the king of fierce countenance appears. That's why after the leopard kingdom comes that fourth beast kingdom, which is dreadful and terrible. So let's get back to Revelation 17. Um, so we see, we see the five who have fallen, okay? Uh, verse 10, so the time that John was writing, he was writing under um, that third beast kingdom, which was the leopard with four heads and four wings of a fowl. Rome had taken over, but Rome is just a continuation of the Grecian Empire. Okay, Greece is the fountainhead. Greece is from where all Western thought, all Western ideals, all Western, you know, civilization. It is the, um, it, it is the springboard, okay, of everything that we see in today's modern world according to Western culture, okay. And so it's still in charge. Rome just took over. So um, John is prophesying in regards to the seven kings who are going to come. Um, and even the eighth uh, at the time when the leopard kingdom is destroyed. Verse 10, and there are seven kings, five are fallen. The five who had fallen at the time John wrote this was Alexander the Great and then those four generals. They had fallen by the time John had written this. Then John said that there's one, there's one who is. The one who is is Caesar. Okay, Caesar was in control now at the time that John wrote this in 90 AD, okay? So Caesar had taken over, but is still under that leopard kingdom, okay? That leopard kingdom is still on the scene at the time that John wrote this, okay? It had four wings of a fowl, okay? It had spread to the four corners of the world, uh, uh, Western influence, okay? The Hellenization of the whole world. Rome was still in, well, Rome was in charge, okay? And, and the one who was, the one who is, was Caesar. Okay, but then John says he's prophesying and the other is not yet come. So there's a seventh king who's going to come. And when the seventh king comes, he must continue a short space. Okay, so the seventh king is the king who's going to be in charge at the time when this is, um, when this is fulfilled. At the latter time of that Grecian empire, when the transgressors are come to the full, the seventh king is going to be in charge when the transgressors have come to the full. Okay, the seventh king is not the king of fierce countenance. The king of fierce countenance, he's the eighth king. That's the Antichrist. But the seventh king, who only continues for a short space, is uh, he's going to be in charge at the time when the transgressors are come to the full. He's going to be in charge over Babylon the Great, and God has identified him. He's Donald Trump. 70 years old, seven months and seven days when he took office, won the electoral college vote by 77 votes over Hillary Clinton. He was 700 days old when Israel became a nation again in, on May 14th, 1948. And those are just three identifying markers of the number seven with Donald Trump. I mean, you could, you could do Google searches about it. I have videos about that, but Donald, uh, Donald Trump is the seventh king. He's going to be in charge when it all goes down. And once um, it all goes down, the church will be out of here, and Babylon will have fallen, But and then after that, then the king of fierce countenance appears, who understands dark sentences. He's going to stand up. He's the eighth king. We see that here in Revelation 17, uh, verse 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goes into perdition. Okay, so here we see that um, the Antichrist is the eighth 
who is the beast that was and is not, he is going to be the eighth and is going to be of the seven and goes into perdition. Okay, he's the little horn. He's the one who appears. Um, he's the king of fierce countenance who comes uh, when Babylon the great is destroyed, when the wings are plucked, and then um, uh, uh, the lion stands up with the mind of a man, with the mouth of a lion, and uh, it's this guy right here, he, when he stands up, and his power, verse 24, Daniel 8, his power will be mighty, but not by his own power, he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper, and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people, and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He also shall stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Okay, so this is the eighth king, the Antichrist, the king of fierce countenance. He comes after the seventh king who only continues for a short space. The seventh king who John prophesied in his day that he hadn't come yet. But when the seventh king comes, he's only going to continue for a short space. Okay, he's not going to be on the scene for very long. That seventh king is Donald Trump, the one who's going to be in charge of Babylon the Great at the time when she is destroyed, because he's the treacherous dealer who's going to bring forth the peace plan, which is going to have language in it that recognizes a Palestinian state in the nation of Israel, the nation that um, the land that God promised to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as an everlasting promise. So um, once um, uh, Donald Trump releases this peace plan, which has language in it, which is going to divide up the land officially and recognize a, a Palestinian state. And um, um, uh, uh, well, the curse is going to come. Okay. I mean, I want to go down that, that hole today. Uh, but there's going to come a curse, and the curse is the beginning of the day of the Lord. It's when God comes out of his place. It's the whole shebang. Um, but for those who are ready, we'll be raptured out of here, and we'll be taken to the Father's house. I pray that this teaching was edifying for those who listened. Uh, I pray that I wasn't all over the place. I pray that the Holy Spirit guided it. I know there were other questions, and I haven't got to them yet. But as you can see, I want to be I want to be thorough whenever I do teachings. That's why they go on for like, you know, hour or two, <laughs> you know, but you just can't you just can't. Um, I just don't know how you could teach without going, you know, line upon line. You know, you, I just you just can't handle the word, you know, haphazardly. You know, that's why you get all these false teachings talking about three days of darkness before the rapture. OK, come on. The Bible says it's going to be a regular day. A regular day, the trumpet's going to sound, one taken, the other one left. Okay, It's going to be just as it was in the days of Noah, just as it was in the days of Lot. It was a regular day until Noah was shut into the ark and until Lot was taken out of the city. And then the destruction came. Likewise, it's going to be on the cloudy day when God comes out of his place. It's going to be a regular day. No three days of darkness. Okay, now if you're left behind, <laughs> well, that's a totally different picture. Oh, it's going to be dark. You better believe it. Okay, it's going to be it's going to be dark. You better believe it because the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. It is even very dark with no brightness in it. Okay, um, I, I pray that for those who don't know you, King Jesus, this is all you have to do, ABC. Like Pastor J.D. Farag always says, admit that you're a sinner, A. That means that you agree that you are wrong and God is right. You repent. You say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Then you believe, B. So once you um, admit that you're a sinner, you believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And he did what he said he did, which is he died on the cross, buried in a borrowed tomb, and on the third day, he rose from the dead. He did that to justify us. He did that to forgive us. He did that to give us eternal life. Okay, he did it all for us. He gave his life as a ransom for many. And if you believe in his sacrifice, his atonement, which means that uh, the blood that he shed was sufficient to cover, not only cover, but to take away your sin forever and ever. Your sin is totally forgiven by his blood. And by the power of his resurrection, 
He guarantees us eternal life when we believe. And if you've done that, then you confess. You confess with your mouth, okay? Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and you shall be saved. And that's what Romans 10 tells us. If, you, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God has risen Jesus Christ from the dead, we shall be saved. It's as simple as that. So the choice is yours. The days are evil and the King is coming. I pray that you'll be in that number when the saints go marching in because that trumpet is about to blow. Keep on watching and praying always and may the grace of God be with you forever and ever. In Jesus' name, I love you. Amen.